This is the review of your midterm as promised so that you can take a look and understand why you got questions, why you got them correct. And if you did not get them correct, um, why you did not get them correct, of course, as I had mentioned in class last week, please. Um, so we don't. So the reason we did not go over it if you weren't there or don't recall is because I didn't want to take up class time. Um, which is so valuable and it goes so fast. So we'll just, we'll do it this way. And then please feel free. I will have that time um, whenever. I mean, it could be via email. If you want to have a conversation after class, it could be during class. But if you don't understand something, of course, let me know. So let's just get started. I am going to skip over some of these because they're either repetitive questions or um, things we've gone over many, many times. And if for some reason I don't go over something that you were curious about, again, please let me know. So I'll try to make this short and concise because I know that you all have a lot to do as well, um, but I just wanna make sure that we get this on point here. So um, the first, I believe like 15 questions have been reviewed before. However, just um, to reiterate um, that number one has to do with, you know, again, what is the NCLEX all about? It is about safety. So we're definitely going to want to make sure that this person who's calling this crisis hotline, number one, is going to be, are you thinking about hurting yourself? That is going to be the first thing you're going to do. As I mentioned in class, you'll probably ask all of these questions at some point or some of them, but if you could only ask one question, it's going to be the safety question, which is, are you thinking of hurting yourself? The second one we did go over as well about what agoraphobia was, what that means. And um, the answer to this one, we talked about and explained how it has to do with um, fear of public transportation, agoraphobia, meaning um, being having, it's an anxiety disorder and being in large places and having that um, severe anxiety. The next one, the OCD one, we went over as well. This one, I, I will say it again. I do think that this one is quite difficult, but this, the answer that we talked about, and I hope I explained well in class had to do with, do you, uh, no, 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 is it, uh, do you have trouble controlling, sorry, <laughs> upsetting thoughts? So that would be the most, um, closely related. I do find these two, uh, it, it is to me too it's a toss-up but they're really more talking about like ADHD here so are you the it's upsetting controlling thoughts because it's the obsessions and the compulsions these ones as you can tell I'm going over way faster because we've had them before we know um that therapeutic communication doesn't always have to be um, open-ended we prefer it to be because we want to get the most information but I really like to ask this question in every single class I have because it doesn't have to be necessarily uh, then we move on to this one that we've had on a two-point quiz as well, uh, um, at least once. And we learned about silence when we talked about communication. And it's a very interesting way of therapeutic communication because you think of silence. Well, that's not talking. That doesn't mean there's not communication. And um, it's, I have found again and again and again, I will keep saying it to be extremely helpful. And I hope you have to, although a little bit awkward as you know, <laughs> you learn to utilize it. Uh, number six, I believe all of these, everyone got correct. Um, you all did very well, by the way. So thank you again. I think I said this in class, but we know our, um, five hallucinations that we've talked about. So I'm not even going to go over them. Um, number seven has to do with tardive dyskinesia. So this one, I definitely wanted to make sure to put on here because there seems to be, and it's, it's kind of universal actually, when people tend to, for my experience with, with students, it, starting to begin to learn about the uh, medications between an antipsychotic and medications that can help with tardive dyskinesia and kind of learning all this new terminology. It's like a different language. So just a um, quick reminder, EPS, which is extra pyramidal symptoms, tardive dyskinesia goes underneath that, right? And that happens, unfortunately, when our dopamine levels tend to go too low and um, this can be short-term, long-term, depending on how fast we catch it. But if we're having these uncontrollable, basically neuromuscular movements, um, what medication can actually um, help help with these? It's not going to be in Vega. That's an antipsychotic. There is a medication that can help with this, which is Cogentin. So it's not the second one there. And then Selexa, I don't even think we've talked about it, but I just threw it in there because it kind of 
I wasn't trying to confuse you, but it, it had the same letter that started with cogentin, which is C. So Celexa is actually an SSRI just for fun. I'll let you know that if you are not aware. Um, it's not one that's on your list that you need to know, but the answer here is cogentin. So please, just a reminder, cogentin is a medication that helps acetylcholine in your brain. And as we've spoken of, acetylcholine in your brain has to, it, one of the things that it does is helps our neurons fire more quickly. So they have found that with this medication that many people do respond to it pretty well. And it may not be perfect, but it can definitely help kind of slow that down, therefore helping the tardive dyskinesia or extra permanent symptoms, what have you. Okay, so please just knowing that cogentin is not an antipsychotic. All right, um, this one, definitely, I think this is ingrained in everyone's mind, um, having to do with MAOIs, what ingredient must we avoid? Definitely, definitely, definitely tyramine. Um, some of you put down a, a bunch of examples. That was great, you didn't have to, but hey, awesome. Love to know that you know, it's sinking in. Again, I know this is a lot of information. Um, the next one, which of the following is a positive symptom of schizophrenia? Um, we know negative takes away from your personality, positive adds to it. So a positive, sim positive symptom would be an illusion. Um, and that's actually the only one because that's the only one that's adding. So hallucination, delusion, illusion, those are all positive because it's adding to someone's personality. Negative would be isolation because that's, you know, being by yourself, you're, you're within withdrawal, you know, being in withdrew from one another or from other wanting to be around you or you wanting to be around them. My, my apologies. And then um, depression and flat affect, those all three kind of go together as being, being withdrawn. So the only positive symptom of schizophrenia here is the illusion. And then the other three are negative. So fill in the blank. Uh, psychosis is a detachment from reality. Um, excellent job, you guys. And then just looking over real quick, which question was this? Uh, you are a nurse, the psychiatrist gathering information. And this is kind of a convoluted question, but, uh, you know, trying to paint the picture and have you think about what's going on. So during the time of this assessment, the patient explains that they have been having symptoms that involve some symptoms of schizophrenia and other symptoms of a mood disorder. Okay, right there. Boom. Schizophrenia and mood disorder. What does that equal? Um, we know is schizoaffective disorder. And so the question's asking, as you are discussing this information with the psychiatrist, what diagnosis may you suggest based off the information that you've gathered during your assessment? Well, this is a very common thing that we do as nurses. And it would be, and my apologies, I spelt it wrong. Um, but schizoaffective disorder, nobody got this one wrong. So, um, I, yeah, there was no, um, because I wasn't trying to, I will never try to confuse you by spelling something wrong. If it's like one letter like that, I'm not going to, so I hope everyone knew that. Um, so yes, so schizoaffective disorder or, um, having symptomology of both, um, schizophrenia and a mood disorder or schizophrenia bipolar. That's how I um, explain it. Uh, moving along, this one has been asked uh, several times because we know that NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, is um, one of those ones that can potentially cause death. It's one of the four side effects of antipsychotics, the four major side effects of antipsychotics being EPS symptoms, um, metabolic syndrome, NMS, and I'm completely completely blanking. Oh, and a granulocytosis. So those are the four main symptoms of antipsychotics. So this one here, unfortunately, is one that can cause death. I know that the agranulocytosis can as well, but this one is kind of like one of the ones that would most likely be on your NCLEX. So I really, again, I'm trying to pick those ones, um, but we've also explained and talked about the other as well. So this was on that 18 question thing I gave you at the very beginning. Um, so we know that the answer here would be tachypnea. That is one of the following things. And why tachypnea? Because we've talked about the diaphragm. It The muscles become even more rigid and one, it makes sense. One would have trouble breathing, right? So tachypnea we know is um, fast, fast breathing basically because they're having trouble breathing. All right, moving along. 
A patient who was diagnosed with schizophrenia six years ago has been in and out of a lockdown unit due to medication compliance and now has returned back again for the ninth time. As the nurse is giving the physician's assistant your assessment, knowing what you know about the medication that may be more successful with a patient of basically we're asking here a patient that is tends to be non-compliant and um, it says right here, antipsychotic, which one do we think is going to be best? Oral Abilify, because then I put oral Abilify because there is an injectable form that's long, a shorter one for one month and then a longer one now for two months. So that's why I put oral Abilify to make sure to like signify this only lasts in your body for so long. Cogentin is not an antipsychotic. Um, so we know that, so we know it can't be that. Zyprexa, is an antipsychotic only given in the oral form. And then we've talked about this before. In Vega, it lasts for um, one to three months, depending on which one you have. So this would be a great potential long-lasting antipsychotic for somebody who is non-compliant. Please explain the definition of a delusion and give one example. Um, unfortunately, some of you did not give one or the other. You, you may have, I think it was more, some people, only gave the example, but not the um, uh, definition. And I wasn't, I mean, I, I and I did, of course, I did, took off the points. And this is more about reading the direction or reading the whole question. And I know this happens to all of us, but again, I don't want to disservice anyone in any way. And on your NCLEX, you can't go back, right? So really learning and on orders, reading from a physician or whomever. So that's why if you saw that, it's like, oh, come on, you know, I know. Why'd you take off a point? Well, it's it's a good reinforcement, right? Um, and you all did very well. So please explain the definition. So a delusion it would be a false fixed belief. Give one example. Um, I'm just going to give, some of you gave some just like, I'm like, wow, very creative. Very, really good. Um just very creative and others gave exactly what I said in class which is just fine it had to do um you know either with CA the you know um uh, with aliens uh, uh things like that and then the maybe the pill example that I gave thinking that this is poison and because that's a false fixed belief if it's really not poison in the cup it's a pill um of uh melatonin right so very well done um, okay. So you are in a clinical, this, this one, um, I did notice that some people got wrong. So please, again, let me know if you're, ha if you had trouble with this and why, but I'm going to try to explain it here. So you're in a clinical setting where you are treating patients who are being treated for mental health diagnoses. As you walk by the dining area, uh, um, dining area, sorry, you notice a patient who is talking to his fork. You are such a good boy but I will give you a dog treat after I am done eating my dinner with. So you approach the patient to check in and he introduces his fork as his dog buster, which type of positive symptom is he currently experiencing? So he's having a psychotic experience and it's a positive symptom. So it's going to add. So we know it's going to either be a delusion, a hallucination or an illusion. Um, based upon what we know now, he has an actual object. So it's an actual object. So it's not a hallucination because there's actually something that he's talking to, which is the fork. And then he's misinterpreting the fork as his dog. So that would be an illusion. So remember, if you have an external um, object, like a water bottle, for example, that you can actually, and other people can, that are not having um, illusions, in that moment can see the water bottle and you're saying the water bottle is a telephone that is an illusion you're mistaking one external object for another this person is this individual is thinking that their fork is a dog therefore that would be an illusion now if they looked at the chair next to them and said oh my god do you see my dog buster sitting in the chair then that would be a, vis a visual hallucination because you're not saying the chair's buster you're saying do you see my dog sitting in the chair now if you if you were petting the the chair and saying what a good boy buster then that would be an illusion because the external object would be the chair any questions about that please let me know i know that this stuff it it can be confusing but i feel like the more we go over it you guys are just it, it's it's sinking in um so the next one here is i did a lecture that i posted that spoke about this that there's a second time in life 
um, where people will unfortunately start to have kind of that suicidal peak. And that is at 75 years of age. And then there's a question later on, I'll just address it right now. And why would that potentially be? And um, even if you didn't get this one right, I, I noticed, I think everyone got the other one right. Just think even on their own, just kind of thinking about, well, you know, loved ones around them are dying, maybe chronic, more chronic pain, feeling, you know, afraid of the inevitable of death coming, um, losing your spouse, things like that. Um, not having as much control over, you know, your body being able to do things. And there's, there's, a, I would have taken any answer that made sense. <laughs> and I did, I, I believe. So the next one has to do with a patient states during an assessment that they are failing SI. We know that suicidal ideation. What would be the best question for you to ask next? We talked about this. It's very, very important. Of course, we're going to ask more questions after this. But the very first thing we want to ask is, do you have a plan? That would be the first thing that we ask them. Just like if someone said that they were hearing voices, the very first thing we're going to ask are, what are the voices saying? Because we want to get th that information and then we go from there. So that is the um, answer to number 17. Number 18, which of the following is considered an anxiety disorder? I believe I gave you six um, and I posted it. Um, so you guys know, now I just post my notes from the agenda. I think that's a great way. I think it's working really well. So I'm just going to continue doing that. I think just in general, I'm going to add that into how I teach because I, I really like it. And I think you guys do as well. And it seems helpful. Um, so an anxiety disorder, not sadness, um, not depression. Depression is a mood disorder. Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder. We talked about that last week. Um, PTSD was under there. So PTSD is an anxiety disorder, just like agoraphobia, OCD, generalized anxiety. Those are all, um, and again, I gave you six um, of them on there. We talked a little bit about each of them, but PTSD would be your answer as which one of these is an anxiety disorder. Moving along, true or false, an MAOI medication must be closely monitored for several reasons, one being due to the possibility of hypertensive crisis. Yes, true, true, true. And why? Because tyramine, and that's why, so hopefully we can make this connection if we haven't yet. Um, and this is how I always remembered it as well. So we know tyramine. I, everyone's got that down in their brain. We've talked about it. I've lectured about it. I've It's on the, the that thing that we do, um, those flashcards. Oh my God, hello. Was lit. And as well as we have, you guys have done a lot of homework on it, but why? So tyramine this medication raises the level of tyramine in your body. So then if you're taking in other tyramine from other sources, tyramine in itself causes blood pressure to go up. So that is the, the connection and the link between it. Of So it's not hypotensive crisis, it would be hypertensive. So just think tyramine increases the blood pressure or it has the ability to do that. So that's one reason why we have to be so careful with MAOIs. That's one of the several reasons. And tyramine is because it can cause a hypertensive crisis because tyramine causes the blood pressure to go up. And what can a hypertensive crisis cause? Just, I'll give you one example. And I think most of us know this, a stroke. And we don't want that. We don't want our patient to have a stroke. Um, okay. A 23-year-old female is taken to the emergency room. We have a, we had a similar question like this, I believe, on another test. But and during her assessment, she reveals that she is having SI. What does SI stand for? And what type of hold will this patient be put on due to her SI? Actually, you guys have not. This is the first time you had it. So we know SI is suicidal ideation. We've talked about that before. So that leaves us with three possible ones. And then it asks, what type of hold will she be put on? So we know that the first hold would be a 5150, which is up to 72 hours. So it would be suicidal ideation, sorry, suicidal ideation, 72 hour hold that is called a 5150. That would be the answer. If they were going to continue to hold the patient, then it would go to a two week hold of a 5250. Um, we wouldn't do suicidal ideation and then let the patient be um, to go home. So the answer is here. Again, let me know if you have questions on um, any of these as we go through them. Uh, okay. This one, I will say um, was probably, there were probably like three to four of them that were the, if were the most missed um, because we did have, I put two extra credit. Well, one just bonus one for everyone just as like 
thank you for, you know, doing well in the class and then a bonus question um, at the end. So, but this is one that I found that was quite missed often. So let's, let's go through it. You have a patient who is very concerned with the amount of anxiety she has been feeling since starting her new management position three months ago. She exper- or sorry, she expresses to you as the RN, or she expresses to you as yeah, you as the RN that she does not want. So she's so she does not want to have anything that's potentially addictive. So we already know. Okay, so boom, we know that. So I can just look at the medication. It, uh, does Ativan have the potential to be potentially habit forming? Yes. Does Boostbar? No. Cogentin? No. Hydroxyzine? No. Okay. So I already know Ativan's out. Then um, moving along, and that she also um, wants to make sure she doesn't want to take anything off label for anxiety either because she doesn't like the fact that it's not FDA approved. That's okay. And that's her right, right? We want to meet our patients where they're at. So we know Ativan because of the potential addiction um, or have, whatever you would like to call it. Um, uh, so no Ativan and then nothing off label. So is Boost Bar off label as an anti-anxiety medication? No, that is on label. So that is why we give it. Cogentin is not for anxiety. We've talked about that. It helps with um the EPS symptoms for someone who is having schizophrenia and then hydroxyzine, gabapentin, and propranolol were the three that we specifically talked about that are off-label. So if this patient doesn't want anything off-label or potentially habit-forming, we know right off the bat that hydroxyzine and Ativan are not going to be it. Cogentin doesn't even fit the category. So the answer would be Boost Bar. Again, let me know if you have questions. Uh, true or false, all patients that are diagnosed with schizophrenia will present with the same symptoms. I'm not even going to go over this. We've talked several times about different spectrums, this, that, the other. Um, definitely, we know that people are going to present differently and not always present the same with the same diagnoses. Um, which of the following is not considered a hallucination? So not. So smelling feces when no feces is present and no one else can smell the feces. That is would be a hallucination, right? That would be a olfactory hallucination because you're smelling something that is not there and nobody else can, you know, smell. Seeing Bill Clinton sitting next to you, but nobody else can see Bill Clinton. We know that's a visual hallucination. Feeling something crawling on your skin, but no- nothing, apparently I'm throwing in my ghetto here. <laughs> nothing is crawling on your skin. Um, that would be wrong because that's a tactile hallucination. And then the next one is drinking from a water bottle, but thinking you are drinking from a water fountain. So which one of these is not considered a hallucination? It would be the last one because that would be a what? You are taking an, an external, actually this would be a delusion, a false fixed belief because you're drinking water from water bottle, but you're thinking you're drinking from a water fountain. That's a, it could actually go both ways because that could be a delusion or an illusion. So, and I honestly forgot I even put that on there and I'm really glad that we did because as, as I'm reading it, I can see how it could be both ways. But, but the important part is we know it's not a hallucination and the other three are. So if you have questions about why it could be either a delusion or an illusion, a delusion for sure, right? Because you have a, it's a false fixed belief. You're thinking for sure one thing is something and it's and it's not it's not the other way is it is an external object but you're not necessarily you are mistaking it for something as well so it's both oh i like that i like that that happened because it can be both and it's confusing right but as long as you can understand the difference and these are hallucinations and this is not okay which of the following medications can be used off label for anxiety choose all that apply so we went over them in class oh uh, like 12 15 times um hydroxyzine propranolol and gabapentin so hopefully you put hydroxyzine gabapentin and propranolol tylenol um uh, is not one that applies we know that is acetaminophen and that is um for pain sorry pain relief or for an antipyretic uh next one what is the book uh dsm-5 True or false, when using a medication off-label, this medication can be used over-the-counter, such as Benadryl or a prescription such as gabapentin. That is true. We've talked about that a couple times, and I believe it's also on Quizlet. So yeah, over-the-counter or prescription medication can both be considered off-label if it's just being used for a different purpose than it was intended for. 
Uh, we have a 47 year old male with schizophrenia who is petting the remote control, asking you if you would like to pet his cat Fluffy in the day room while being in an inpatient unit. Which of the following is taking place with this patient? This was another one that was missed a lot. So I'm I'm seeing. So what I'm learning from this in the fork question has to do with hallucinations, delusions, and illusions. Um. Well, I already know that they're not the easiest things to understand, um, but really, hopefully this will help to reiterate that um, because you will see some of these questions again or very similar ones on your final. And I would love love you to get them right and, and also love you to understand and like get the idea of it because you're going to, again, work with patients in this realm no matter where you work. Okay, so we have someone who is petting a remote control, but... The, it's a remote control. It's not a cat. So an, it's an external object, but mistaking it for something else. What would that be? Just, it's the same one as the fork. It's an illusion. So the answer would be an illusion. All right. A depletion of dopamine caused by Abilify can possibly cause which of the following that we spoke about in cl class multiple times. This one was also, I, I was a little bit surprised, but, you know, again, I, we're tired. <laughs> Maybe we misread it. Um, so a depletion of dopamine, and I do understand why people would put depression because when we think of dopamine, we think of euphoria because that's what it can cause if we have too much of it. Um, which we'll definitely talk about when we talk about substance use and all in that topic. So I, I get, I, I can wrap my head around it, but I was really hoping it, that it was a my question. Would, would be read a little bit more straightforward, but maybe it wasn't. And that's why we're going over it, of course. So if we have a depletion of dopamine, and that's why I put caused by Abilify. So Abilify, if we know it's an antipsychotic, and we know that that is the reason that in our brain, so remember, this is not just in one part of the brain. It's, it's like a universal part of your brain. So if we know Abilify is causing us to have a depletion of dopamine, what more than likely is going to happen? you're going to notice extra pyramidal symptoms, right? Just like how we say Parkinsonianism or tardive dyskinesia because EPS is like the umbrella. And then underneath that, some people use the word Parkinsonianism. I used to always use it. Now I just use EPS because par technically Parkinsonianism and tardive dyskinesia, they're very similar, but Parkinsonianism, it, it's not permanent and tardive dyskinesia can be. And so I don't even go into it. Because again, we're general generalist, and it's confu it's confusing enough. Um, sorry, I'm having groceries delivered. Just, I'm gonna pause it real quick. There might be a little bit more barking. Um, not my phone's ringing. I'm gonna just pause it again. My apologies in case they can't find my house. Just one moment. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so a depletion, I don't know why this clicked it. I don't even know if it's the right answer. No, I think it is actually, but okay, let's, yeah, so it is. Um, a depletion of dopamine caused by Abilify. So we know it's specifically caused by Abilify can possibly cause which of the following that we spoke about in class multiple times. So not depression, because it has to do strictly with the Abilify causing the dopamine to lower, having to do with a patient looking as though they have Parkinson's disease. And that has to do with lack of uh, the dopamine in the substantia Niagara. So that's going to look like tardive dyskinesia. And that's where cogentin comes in. So that is why it is this answer. So again, let me know if you have any questions. Which of the following is an injection that is classified as an antipsychotic that can last for one to three months, depending on which one is given. We talked about this one many, many times as well. And all of these except cogentin can be given. So cogentin, we already know is not an antipsychotic. So boom. Cross it off in your mind. Abilify can be a long-term injection, um, but not up to three months. And Thorazine can be given as an and oh my goodness, Thorazine can be given as an injection as well, but does not last long. We know in Vega can go up to three months. And that's why I make sure to put three months. <laughs> All right, short answer. If WBC can be affected by antipsychotic medications. What effect does it have and what potential problem can this lead to for the patient who is on the medication? Um, so as we've talked about the four main side effects, I'm going to say it again, agranulocytosis, um, which is low B, 
WBCs and metabolic syndrome, NMS, and tardive dyskinesia. Those are the four major side effects of an antipsychotic. So it's going to be, and actually this one was, um, I would say, and I, this is all on recall, of course, but I, I was, um, I, I know a couple of you do not get this one correct. Um, there were a lot of increased blood sugar. Um, that would have had to do more if I was talking specifically about uh, the fact of metabolic syndrome, then it, then that would be the answer. Cause remember metabolic syndrome has to do with increased, um, blood sugar, increased weight and in hyperlipidemia, diabetes. And we know once one, one of those starts, it kind of can be catastrophic. So it, it's not this, not risk for SI, um, not decrease risk for infection because if it's lowering, right. A granulocytosis, it's lowering it, meaning we're going to have more risk for infection. Uh, next question, the nurse cares for a young mother scheduled for a breast biopsy. The client tells the nurse, if I lose my breast, I know my spouse will no longer find me attractive. Which response by the nurse is most therapeutic? So I did throw in about three or four of these that are therapeutic questions and wanting to see, okay, looking at it, can you do depict what is the most therapeutic answer and since you know we, we do not that I need to make an excuse for this but I just want to let you know I felt it was very fair because we have gone over therapeutic communication I would say most of you got at least one of like the four wrong some of you got two of them but between having the extra credit in the class, I, I do like to give assignments because I think they're extremely helpful to understand the material in conjunction with the quizzes, in conjunction with the lecture, in conjunction with everything else we do. So, um, I mean, if you missed a couple of these and it's kind of like you feel like we didn't go over it, we, we did. It's just now applying it. So I hope that that was clear and no one had any, I got no emails or any questions about it, but I just wanted to say why I did it or why I chose to put these on there. Okay. Now, so we have um, a mother. They're going to have a breast biopsy. Um, definitely very scary, right? And afraid of, I mean, this is a absolutely, I mean, I dealt with patients with this similar or exact kind of same scenario. This, These are all Kaplan questions, by the way, the ones that I did throw in the therapeutic, um, the therapeutic, uh, sorry, the therapeutic questions like this one and the OCD one, like handing the towel, all those are from Kaplan questions and they're pa passing NCLEX questions. So what are we going to say as a nurse that's therapeutic here? So the first one or first option is you have concerns of how your spouse will think of you. Well, I like this. It's open-ended. It's kind of clarifying because, you know, you want to make sure, to, of course, that we are addressing the the right um topic that your patient is concerned about of course and then the second one is i understand why you are upset we really try not to say that because it's not intentionally condescending but do you understand why i'm upset um something just as a side note of what i will say if i want to say this but not in those words is i've been through something similar i can't imagine how you're feeling because i know we process things differently or you know I, and I'm gonna making this up on the spot or if a student's talking to me about being stressed out with school or feeling very anxious that's usually how I'll, I'll approach it as well like I've gone through anxiety and I'm in school right now I don't know wh what's going on in your body in your mind and how you're handling it but I felt anxiety again I don't know how you're feeling it so I can only imagine that must be very difficult so that's just a side note of kind of, if you like, if you like that tactic, great. If you don't just want to throw it out there. Okay. So we tend to try not to do this. I understand that you're upset. And then it goes on to say, but after your breast reconstruction, your breasts will look normal. So that's, that's actually not therapeutic. There were some of you that did choose this one. Um, and, and I want to explain why. So we already talked about that. I understand why you're upset. First of all, what is normal? Do we know that, first of all, do we even know they have cancer, right? Do they Are they going to have to have breast reconstruction? Because a biopsy does not equal breast reconstruction. But when it really comes down to it, even not to go that deep into the question is, 
we don't know that the breasts will look quote unquote normal and what that means. And this can be said in so many different ways that could be much more therapeutic. That's, I think I'm going to leave it at that just so it doesn't get too convoluted there. But even if you had to go between the first one and the second one, the first one's definitely more therapeutic. And I think you guys can, as we're talking about it now, can see that. The next one is wait and see what your spouse's reaction is before you get upset. That's kind of too direct and like almost boundary-ish where this is not where a boundary needs to be put, right? And I'm going to, again, leave it at that because I think that that is... um. I think it's pretty clear, but if you don't, please let me know. And then the next one, definitely not therapeutic, condescending and just kind of like dismissing what the patient is even saying and not, you're not um, addressing what they're trying to, I mean, they're obviously upset, right? So you should focus on getting well, your children are young and they need you. I mean, we may say that to like a friend or something. I, I, so I personally wouldn't, um, but definitely number one is the most therapeutic it's open-ended it's the other three have kind of glitches in them so you're just clarifying what the patient is saying to you so you're having concerns about how your spouse will what they're going to think of you and then you can get more information and then go back and forth and have this therapeutic conversation all right next one is the nurse provides care for patients in the emergency room which will be seen first we've talked about this one many 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 times um don't you love how I put this twice? <laughs> you know, it's not that one. Um, so NMS is more um, potentially fatal. Sorry about all these typos. I didn't even notice it till now. My apologies. Um, and it's going to be more because this is potentially um, this can cause death. This one can it doesn't. All right. So wasn't trying to confuse you here. Just again, making sure we're reading the question and what it's asking. Where is about 10% of serotonin in the body? Um, a couple of you put the vascular system, and I've noticed this does happen um, with every time I use this question. And I'm curious why. I and no one has to tell me, but I'm just kind of curious, like if anybody maybe why they put maybe I should ask. Um, but we we know that about 90% of it's in the gut. We talked about that and for several reasons why it's in the gut, and that's why gut and brain health go very, very hand in hand. So 10% of serotonin is in the brain. Which of the following antidepressants are considered SNRIs? Um, I did ask you to please make sure that you know that because we talked about three of each. So SNRIs are going to be Effexor, Prestique, and Cymbalta. So the only one there that won't fit is Prozac. That is an SSRI. Uh, true or false, Trazodone is classified as an antidepressant, but is used off-label for insomnia that is absolutely true. This was on the board. Um, I had you guys take pictures of it. We talked about it. It's on Quizlet. Um, we had a discussion about it. If it didn't sink in then, please, please, please. I know you will see this somewhere at some time. Um, it's, it's getting more and more popular because it's not considered um, habit forming. We don't use it. I've never seen it used as an antidepressant. Remember, this is the one you must have a therapeutic dose of 400 to 600 milligrams to even touch serotonin. And then it makes people so tired. So like the average dose is like 50 to like 150 milligrams to help people sleep. So we use it off label for insomnia. If we're using it at 50 to 150 milligrams to help someone sleep, are they getting any benefit for their depression? No, because they're not getting the dose of that they need to even touch serotonin, which is 400 to 600 milligrams. All right. So the next one, you walk into the day room at a lockdown mental health facility and your patient is petting the remote control and telling the remote what a great caddy is. What is the patient experiencing? Um, so these are very, very similar between Fluffy and the other one. And I'm just, I was trying to reinforce, um, it is an illusion because you are mistaking an external object for another. I, and I kind of, I wasn't again, trying to confuse you, but I, I was thinking, I want to make sure, you know, it's on audit. I'm sorry, visual hallucination because they, they actually have an object. Um, what book is the, oh, apparently I asked this twice. Um, yay for you. Right. <laughs> Cause hopefully you guys all got it. Um, these tests are hard because sometimes it's like, I'll write half, like half one day, a little bit another, and then I forget and then even going through it, you just don't know. So, hey, I guess look at it as a good thing. Um, really reinforcing the information. What book is used to diagnose um, a mental health disorder? It would be the DSM-5. 
Next one, a patient is prescribed Haldol. Haldol, um, I asked you guys to please make sure that you know this medication as being in the category of an antipsychotic. And you note upon your assessment that they have tongue rolling, all of this stuff happening. This is involuntary muscle movement. So we, are, we already are thinking tardive dyskinesia. I'm hoping that's what's happening in your head. So what are we going to more than likely be prescribing for this condition? So this is very, very similar to the other one. I was really trying to reinforce it and it's going to be cogentin. As a side note, and I don't teach this, I said it in class, another medication that can be given is Benadryl. Um, I would never put them in the same category. I didn't teach it, so I would never ask it. But just as a side note, Benadryl can be helpful for um, uh, tardive dyskinesia as well, or Parkinsonianism, or those involuntary muscle movements. It's not, I would say it's not used as often, but I have seen it used in different clinicals that I've gone to. I just want to say that as a side note, in case you have seen it as well, or you do see it. True or false, you must have schizophrenia to experience psychosis. No. So you you must have, you, you can have, so if you have schizophrenia, you are going to have psychosis. If you have psychosis, you can have a psychotic episode and not be schizophrenic or have schizophrenia. My apologies. Now, on top of that, you must have schizophrenia to experience psychosis. No, but I, I'm not even going to get into, it. I was going to talk about schizoaffective. It's okay. I'll just say, it. so if someone has schizoaffective disorder, do they have to have psychosis? No, because maybe that's not part of the schizophrenia um, symptom that they're having. So because remember schizoaffective is a mixture uh, and it looks different every time, right? Or it doesn't have to be the same for every single person. They're going to have symptoms of both bipolar disorder or mood disorder and schizophrenia. So they don't have to have psychosis, but in, one who has schizophrenia is going to have psychosis. But remember, you can have psychosis and not be schizo have schizophrenia. If that does not make sense, again, please ask me. Um, one free point. I didn't say thank you or smiley face. <laughs> I'm kidding. There were like one or two of you probably freaking out during your test. And by the way, the reason I didn't say like, thank you back or like make notes, apparently like when I make notes down in my little, there's like a box for me. I heard that you guys don't see those. So that's why I don't do that anymore. Um, but usually I would say thank you back or you're great. If you guys said something nice back to me. So I wasn't just like being dismissive. <laughs> All right. The hardest question on the, um, I, I think personally, uh, the RN is doing patient teaching in regards to the side effects in regards, apparently I really want to use this word today, regards to the antipsychotic that the patient's going to be prescribed. What are they? Now this one, it depends. At first I, I said four key side effects. And if I did say that, for those of you who took it really quickly, you'll notice you're, you got a different score. Then I went in and took it away. Because even though there's four, as we go through this, like I said earlier, if you have high blood sugar or pre-diabetic and then hyperlipidemia, and then the, those are all metabolic syndrome. So that counts under a side effect of an antipsychotic, right? Because it's part of me metabolic syndrome. So this was a very critical thinking question. So what are the key side effects um, that a patient during our teaching um, to the patient, do we want to make sure and or the caretaker? Um, if someone's taking an antipsychotic, we really want to watch for metabolic syndrome, which we know we want to watch for an increase in white blood cell count. No, we want to look for a decrease. That's why we have them get their blood drawn so often, which is called agranulocytosis or low white blood cell count, not high possible weight loss. No, because of metabolic syndrome, metabolic syndrome is going to cause potential. Those are like the four main things. I'm not going to say them again. I've already said it in my feet two or three times. Um, so not that one either. It's weight gain. Infection could possibly be more at risk. Absolutely. Because of agranulocytosis, that's low white blood cell count, um, possibly NM, NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, 100%. We talked about that several times. Possible increase in weight gain. Yes, because of metabolic syndrome. And EPS, absolutely, we've talked about that as well several times, extra permeable symptoms. Let me know if there's questions. Um, an RN is caring for clients in the mental health clinic. A woman comes 
to the clinic reporting insomnia and lack of appetite. The client tearfully tells the RN that she was laid off from a job that she has had for 15 years. Which of the following responses responses by the RN is most appropriate? So again, therapeutic um, question. Did your company give you a severance package? Um, not, not therapeutic for what the, 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 the client is talking to you about at this time. Now, if this came up at a later time and it was relevant, then fine. But this is not really addressing what the client's talking about. So I, I'm not really liking this one. So I'm going to continue focus on the fact. And right there is kind of like, you're telling a patient what to do. We, we try to not should people, right? Oh, we should do this or that's not therapeutic. So focus on the fact that you have a healthy, happy family um, I really can't spell. Oh my God. And what's sad about this, I took this a lot, not a lot, but like 25% of these from um, a mission college ADN um, final that I gave like three years ago. And I was horrible at spelling and I should have thought and really, really, really like, meaning I went way too fast. I really should have read this. So I apologize about that. And I will be much more cognizant in the future of that. Because even if you got it right, it's just not really, um, it's not a good look. I don't like it. <laughs> um, yeah, so not therapeutic as well. And the next one is losing a job is a common occurrence, not therapeutic. Again, it's kind of just like sloughing it off. And then the next one, completely open-ended. And if you look at the first three right here, these all kind of look pretty similar as, as far as the way you're addressing the patient. This one sticks out the most. And if it's a not all that apply and one's really sticking out different from the others, not always, but usually that's going to be the correct answer. So tell me what happened. You, you're getting more information because you don't have a ton of information at this point other than, you know, of what happened and having a lack of appetite. Give me more information. Like, let me know what's happening. Uh, next question, the RN cares for a client diagnosed with a terminal um, diagnosis. The spouse of the client states, we have been married for so long. I'm not sure how I can go on now. What is the most appropriate response by the nurse? So again, therapeutic question. So what is the most therapeutic thing we can say to this individual? I will call the hospice nurse to talk to you about this. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, let's see what else we have. Think about the pain and suffering has experienced lately hopefully well i think everyone got this one right but um i forgot a word in there it looks like definitely not therapeutic um because it's kind of like put again not addressing what the patient i hope that this is a um a reoccurring theme that you're seeing that i'm saying is if we're being therapeutic is addressing what the patient is saying not just being dismissive not being um that's like a huge part of it. And that's one reason I really wanted to make sure to put in at least like five of these. If even if you got some of them wrong, you're definitely going to learn from it. And I hope, I hope um, the next one, it sounds like your children will be there to help you during this time of your grieving. Where here does it talk about that? I don't see anything about children. And again, is that the most, if that's all I had out of the three, uh, God, I don't even know what I put. Let, let's see. Um, I mean, now, as you can see, to me, which one sticks out? Because I feel like the first one is called what we say, passing the buck. I'm just going to call the hospice nurse. They're going to take care of this, basically. This individual is saying it to you. Like they're, they're super, I mean, can you imagine this? So calling the hospice nurse is kind of like passing the buck off. Not Okay, I don't want to like have to deal with it. We already talked about the other two. And then the bottom one is very similar to the previous question we talked about earlier. Tell me more about what happened. So tell me more about how you're feeling right now. Like, give me more so that you can hopefully address the specific issues because the patient say, or the patient's spouse is saying, I don't know how I'm going to go on. Um, please explain what a 5150 is compared to a 5250. We know that a 5150 is up to a 72 hour hold. Um, I, many of you put the three reasons you didn't have to, but if you did great. Uh, and then compared to a 5250, I just basically wanted you to know that a 5150 is up to 72 hours and a 5250 is an extension of a 5150. So great job. We're almost through this. Um, what are the three criteria to put an individual on an involuntary hold? So that That's where I asked the question, which would be um, SIHI gravely disabled. Uh, despite repeated interventions in the me mental health unit, 
a client's behavior escalates to verbal abuse. The new client begins to physically threaten other clients in the day room, which action by the nurse is best. So I'm already thinking safety, 100%. If things are starting to escalate, what am I going to do to keep people safe or and hopefully de-escalate the situation? So am I going to tell the patient to calm down? Um, if a patient's already getting aggravated and, and they're in a mental health facility, that's probably going to escalate things even more. So that's definitely not a therapeutic um, technique that we use. The next one is put the client in a quiet room under supervision. I like that one. The next one, um, because we're removing them from the situation and we're decreasing the stimuli. The next one is explain the unit rules to the client. The client's already, put, they're, they're mad. It's, and I think I mentioned this in class before. It's like teaching a patient who is in extreme pain about their discharge teaching. That's not the time to do it. So th this is not really the time to talk about the unit rules if you already have a patient that's heightened and upset. And then the next one, call the client's family to come to the facility. Same thing as I said in the previous one about the hospice nurse. I can see why some of you did put this because some of you did, but we're passing the buck. This patient's under our care. So th that's why they're bringing them to us because they're not able to handle whatever... Um, mental diagnoses or mental health stuff is going on. So, cause it says right here, mental health unit. And even in the hospital, um, they wouldn't do this like a, like a regular, and I'm doing quotes, regular hospital. So the answer would be to let's, let's go ahead and remove that client from that area using a, a good tone. And, you know, let, let, let's go, let's go this way. Let's remove root from here. Let's go sit down and let's talk. Let's try to get you to a place where you're not feeling as agitated, right? So that's going to be your credited answer with that. Next one, you have a patient who's just diagnosed with general anxiety disorder and was prescribed a medication to hopefully assist the patient feel more comfortable with their anxiety, which medication is not usually sedating, drive the bus, <laughs> not considered to be potentially addictive and can be taken and needs to be taken a few times throughout the day. So I was, I was a little disappointed that the, the kind of, I mean, not a, maybe a lot of you didn't get this wrong. I can't remember what class it was. Sorry. Um, Cause we talked about this a lot. And this is one I did on that, like gynecological exam table thing that you guys have in your room, the projector. Um, so we know that Ativan is potentially habit forming. So it's not going to be that one. Clonopin, same thing. Those are both benzos, potentially habit forming. Lorazepam, potentially habit forming. And, um, they can all potentially be sedating. Nurse Mike talked about it. I talked about it. I posted the notes. You guys took pictures. Or I asked you to take pictures. So the answer would be boost bar. I, and I gave you both names. So it's either boost bar or I have trouble saying this one, but it's, the answer is this one. Can you drive the bus? So there you go. What medication classification is gabapentin? We know it's an anticonvulsant. It can be used off label for many things, but its actual classification. And we've talked about that several times and it's been on Quizlet and I've talked about it with many different uh, situations and scenarios. You have a 26 year old female who is telling you that she is having auditory hallucinations. What is a priority question you will need to ask her? I said this earlier. Um, what are the voices saying? Do you have a plan as SI? What are the voices saying? I want to know right now. And even in that moment of the patients, the voices were saying, you're beautiful and I love you. That doesn't mean that we don't need to, as a student, you need to let somebody know. Definitely. Those voices can change in the drop. I mean, boom, to I hate you, go jump off the roof or some, some who knows, or punch you in the face as, as the nursing student. So it's very important to note that and be aware of it, even if this patient's having hallucinations every day. So that's the next thing you're going to ask is what are the voices saying? Because in that moment, what are you trying to do? Keep the patient safe. What are the three antidepressants that are considered SNRIs? Um, did I read the other one wrong or did I ask this question twice? I may have asked it twice, um, but I, I, oh, I just asked it differently. I see. I listed them. So we know it's prestique, effector, and some bolts are SNRIs because that goes to norepinephrine and serotonin. Um, if I answered the other one wrong for some reason and it was SSRI and then the answer would have been Prozac, but I think I was still correct in answering it. 
Um, short answer, name two off-label medications used for anxiety. Off-label, we've talked about them, gabapentin, propranolol, and hydroxyzine. There are more, but those are the three that we're focusing on. Short answer, why are medications that contain serotonin contraindicated for those who have bipolar disorder? Um, it can potentially cause a patient to have a manic episode. And we've talked about that. Well, butrin is considered to be um, what classification? So remember, this is an outlier, but it's still under a classification. It's an antidepressant. So, and it only works on norepinephrine. That's why it's an outlier. Not like an SSRI or an SNRI where an SSRI works on serotonin and SNRI works on serotonin and norepinephrine. Well, butrin is an antidepressant. However, it's an outlier. So the classification would be an antidepressant right here. And we know that it can also help with um, one to stop smoking as well as it can help potentially with ADHD. Uh, the next one is true or false. It is common for general anxiety and depression to be associated and diagnosed together. Yes. And we talked about that and not panic and all, any of that. I don't think anyone got this one wrong. Which of the following is considered a shorter acting benzodiazepine in contrast with the other? We talked about Ativan because it starts at the beginning of the alphabet, which is true. The other name for this is lorazepam. And then um, Valium is diazepam, but going this way, just to try to help you guys um, learn it, because it's opposite of use other names, um, Ativan has the shorter half-life and Valium has a very long half-life. Sorry, I don't even know if that's the answer. Um, for the next one here, which of the following medications are classified as an antipsychotic? Oh, wow. I didn't even mean to do it. I just clicked it anyway. So we know that Valium is not an antipsychotic. That is considered to be a anti-anxiety medication, specifically a benzodiazepine. Prozac is an antidepressant, specifically an SSRI. Lexapro is an antidepressant, specifically an SSRI. Risperidol or risperidone is an antipsychotic. The nurse walks into the room of who into the room of a woman who has obsessive compulsive disorder. The nurse notes the best. I'm sorry. The nurse notes the woman has been vigorously washing her hands. Which response and action is best to take by the nurse? I think this is a hard question, but it's therapeutic, and I, and I want you to please like really like imagine this with me. So is it best for us to say, I'll get you some soothing lotion for your hands while looking in the client's nightstand. If they're vigorously washing their hands, that's telling me right there because they're mentioning that they probably don't want you touching their stuff. They have a, an obsession with germs. So, but okay, we'll, let's, we'll keep that for now. We'll see what else is going on. The next one is it's time to go to the day room. We'll hand you the client a towel. Love it. Love this question. That patient's there for treatment. We're not there to um, be demeaning or, you know, judge their what's going on with them, but we do want to get them to stop washing their hands because we don't want infection to happen and we want safety, correct? So it's time to go to the day room and giving them a towel. It's not um, being, you know, intrusive. Of course we can say, but, but what if this, what if that? Well, again, remember, keep our imaginations intact. Um, so I really like this one so far. The next one is you should stop washing right there. Not, not therapeutic, so I wouldn't choose this one, but you should stop washing your hands because they will get chapped while placing a hand gently on the client's arm. Kind of like number one, if they have a problem with germs, you may not want to do a therapeutic touch with someone with OCD who has it about germs, and that is not a therapeutic statement at the beginning, so it wouldn't be for that one. And then the next one, although I know some of you picked it, I know that you did not mean it demeaning. This is very, it, it can be very demeaning and condescending. Your hands look clean, don't they? While holding up the hands for inspection. Because to this person in their mind, their hands are not clean. And it it is, it's an obsession. And then they're doing the compulsion to relieve the anxiety. So that's why I like to do this to help like explain it. If, and then hopefully it clicks. And I'll say one more, one more time. Let me know if you have any questions. But the credited answer that's correct is it's time to go to the day room while handing the client a towel. And again, if you look at that one, that one sticks out from all the other ones that are kind of handle the situation similarly. And since it's not a select all that apply, it can only be one. So it's this one here. Short answer. 
Why May 2nd peak? We already told you guys about this one. We talked about it. True or false? Therapeutic com- communication is not helpful in other areas other than uh, mental health. We definitely know that's not true, right? Therapeutic communication is great. The school age child tearfully confides to the school nurse that an uncle has been sexually abusive for the past six months. Which statement by the nurse is best? Okay. Another uh, therapeutic and critical thinking question. It takes a lot of courage for you to share this information. Love it. How could your parents not see this was happening to you? Now we have to think about how old is this child? Oh, so uh, this goes back to like NCLEX tips. Okay. How old's the child developmentally? What's going, you know, all of this stuff. I wouldn't say this to any person of any age, but I mean, this is a school age child. Um, so it's almost like blaming the parents, right? We wouldn't say that. Your secret is safe with me. I will not tell anyone until you're ready. I tend to find people choosing this one or the first one uh, most commonly. And it, the answer is one of these two. And then the last one, would you like me to call the police to report this? The reason why we would not choose that one, you're going to do that because you're a mandated reporter. But to say this to a school age child can, who's tearful can be terrifying. So we don't want to escalate that anxiety. So now it comes down to the first one and the third one. Now saying that your secret is safe with me, I will not tell anyone until you're ready rather than it takes a lot of courage to share this information it's actually the first one or the top one is it takes a lot of courage for you to share this information because you're you're coming down to that school age child's developmental level of saying wow like the without saying it but giving them um you're basically giving them the i don't want to say power but kind of that you know like way to go like this is just amazing that you trusted me enough to come talk to me and and reassuring them that they're safe with you this one your secret is safe with me you we can't really say that because we're a mandated reporter and we don't want to lie to the child because then what if the child then says i don't want to tell but it says right here i will not tell until you're ready what if the child changes their mind that you just completely lied to them so that's why um the answer is number one um we're almost done guys if a patient is taking a medication that falls under the category of an maoi what is the washout period that one must wait to be started on another antidepressant two weeks i talked about it nurse mike talked about it two weeks washout period meaning before or after so i think you guys all know what that means um your patient is taking an maoi can they eat avocados oranges and apples absolutely if these were um fermented no which of the following anti-anxiety medications are fast acting? Select all that apply. Which ones are fast acting? Ativan, yes, because it's a benzo. Xanax, yes, because it's a benzo. Boost Bar and Paxil, no, because these ones take, remember, this one's like about four weeks to start working. It was on the pictures that you guys took. And we know Paxil is an SSRI and it can take three to six weeks. So if it's not going to work immediately for anxiety, especially, right? It, it, and even if you have anxiety, so you could have taken the question that way or the other way. So we know that Boost Bar and um, Paxil can help with general anxiety. But if I'm having anxiety right now and I just popped one, that's not going to help with my anxiety. It may help with my general anxiety in the long term, but what's fast acting is what I'm asking. So it's going to be a Benzo, Xanax, and Ativan. Um, what is the rationale for a patient not abruptly stop stopping a benzodiazepine? I did give this to a lot of you that didn't say the word, um, but I want to make sure that you understand what, what I was looking for is seizure precaution. A lot of you put withdrawal. A lot of you put what some of those symptoms are. A lot of you put that, that, and the seizure I gave it. I gave you the answer or gave it to you if you gave me enough for me to understand that you you were wrapping your head around it. But please, 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 in the future, note that benzodiazepine, we don't want to stop it abruptly because, of course, withdrawal and all of that. And then what can withdrawal lead to? Seizures. So thank you. All right. Last one. And this was a little bit tricky and it was meant to be tricky. It's an extra credit question. I already gave you one for free. So um, a patient is being admitted into the mental health unit voluntarily because they feel they need an adjustment to their medications just like cecilia did when she was talking remember the ted talk in the beginning with schizophrenia seeing the clown and the 
in the audience and felt their med her medications were not feeling correct so she voluntarily went into the hospital um that one time not the beginning then okay so right now we're there voluntarily after being in the facility for seven hours they decided they wanted to leave true or false can this patient leave if they came in voluntarily no matter the situation that's the key factor the answer is false no matter the situation, what if within that seven hours they became having SIHI or gravely disabled, then they wouldn't be able to leave. So that's why that answer is that. So, okay, we went over it. I hope this isn't too long. Um, and let me know if you have any questions, you need anything, and I will get this downloaded and um, uh, uploaded. Thank you so much I, um, for everything, you guys, and you did a wonderful job.